As you might know, we've been slowly working on TVC for the past year. A few months ago, we settled on this gimbal design. It improved on all the problems we had on previous designs, but it was still kind of bad. So now we're going to use this new mount I designed. Let's get started. So why do we need a redesign in the first place? The most annoying part of the old TVC mount was that it wasn't a very compact design, so it had a very chunky 4 inch diameter. This is super excessive, especially since the other parts of the rocket didn't need nearly as much space. The next problem is that the motor mount's limit for motor length is only a little over 150 millimeters. What I mean by this is because we have the axles that hold the whole thing together at the top, there's no room for the motor to go up through the top. What we could have done is extend the motor past the bottom, but that would have meant the amount of motor sticking at the bottom would be different depending on what motor we used. This adds another stability variable we don't want to worry about. Lastly, it just looks super ugly. This was basically the first thing I designed in SOLIDWORKS, so I was still learning. Because of this, the initial design was messy, and as I got better at CAD, I only kept on adding things, which made it messier. A complete redesign from scratch would be the most beneficial. This is actually perfect, because all my files were on SOLIDWORKS, but my license expired, so I can't edit or access them. I now have an Onshape student subscription, so that's where all my CAD will be done from now on. So now, let's go over our constraints. Most importantly, it must fit a 29mm motor. This allows us to choose from a much larger selection, including the G8 and the H13. This also means we can use a 24mm motor with an adapter. This is exactly what we'll do for the first test using the E9 motor. Next, also super important, it has to fit in a 3 inch diameter body tube. Like I said earlier, the 4 inch size was way too big, so a 3 inch diameter is the most reasonable for a mount using a 29mm motor. Next, the axles can't go all the way through the mount. In the old design, they were at the top and went all the way through, but this limits the motor's length. Lastly, we need to be able to gimbal 5 degrees in each direction. So I started the design with these constraints in mind. Let's start by looking at what I did in CAD. I started by making the motor mount, which fits a 29mm tube. I left the top open to allow for a longer motor to go through. The next thing I did was I made the outer ring with a 3 inch diameter. I then thickened part of the motor mount to allow the axles to go at least part way through it. Next, I made the inner ring, which as you might tell is in a full circle. The motor mount fits exactly within this flat part, but the rest of the ring is slightly larger to allow for rotation. Then I started working on the platforms for the servo motors. For the inner ring platform, you can see the outside part is flat, but the inside is curved. I did this to allow for the motor mount to rotate 5 degrees. The platform is pretty much as short as possible while allowing the servo to sit on top of the ring. This was to reduce flexing, which was a big problem with the old design. The last main part of the design was to make the servo platform for the outer ring. This was definitely the hardest part of the design. It needs to fit the servo motor within the 3 inch diameter, but it obviously still needs to rotate 5 degrees. If I moved the servo to allow for a 5 degree rotation, it would hang over the edge. If I moved it away from the edge, I wouldn't get a 5 degree rotation. I spent days trying to figure out how to make this work, and there were actually a few nights where I couldn't get any sleep because I couldn't stop thinking about it. Finally, one night at 3am, I figured it out. Both the inner and outer rings were too tall. As you get farther away from the pivot point, the motor mount has to move more. It's like a door. The farther away from the hinges, the more the door moves when rotated. I really should have figured this out earlier, but I shortened the rings by 10mm and that almost did the trick. If I'd used the servo platform like the one here on the inner ring, the wall would have just barely interfered with the motor mount. Because of this, I switched over to this design which is more like a box and has no inner wall so we get that 5 degree rotation. Even now we can just barely get 5 degrees, but it works. The last thing I did was I added this part that sticks out of the motor mount. This will be used to mount the IMU or inertial measuring unit which measures orientation. We'll use it pre-flight to get the TVC mount aligned, then we'll move it to the avionics bay for launch. So that's pretty much it for the TVC mount, but while I'm on this CAD document, let me show you the other stuff I've designed. Let's start with the solenoid and the nose cone. I plan to use a solenoid for shoot ejection, but there's a pretty big challenge with this. A solenoid's actuation range, or the distance it can move, isn't very high. This means the nose cone shoulder, the part of the nose cone that sticks into the rocket, has to be pretty short. If it's too short, it might not stay on very well. This also means the placement of the solenoid has to be pretty precise to still allow room for the parachute but not too far from the nose cone. The nose cone is another design change I made. If you remember from the last TVC video in December, the nose cone was a two-part fairing that housed the parachute and would be split by the solenoid to let the chute out. Two-part nose cones like that don't really work well though so I'm going with this more traditional design. The chute will be just above the solenoid and will get pushed up by this piston that's attached to the solenoid shaft. The chute will hopefully in turn push out the nose cone and get pushed out itself. But you're probably asking, why use a solenoid if it's such a hard problem? The answer to that is it just seems like the simplest approach. I don't really want to use black powder charges or something more complex like a mechanism set off by a servo. However, if it doesn't end up working, I'll probably do one of those two things. The last thing we haven't talked about is the electronics. The first one of those electronics is our homemade altimeter. I've already done a few test flights with it and logged some data, but I never got to validate the data. 
Basically, I want to get the altitude data from our altimeter and a different trustable source, compare the two, and if the values are close enough, it means our altimeter can be trusted. I first tried to do this in January on board a Zephyr Jr. rocket and with an altimeter from Estes to compare with. Our altimeter worked and gave us this graph, but the Estes one said zero feet. I complained to Estes about this and they sent me a replacement, but I didn't trust that one either, so I just bought a Jolly Logic altimeter one. The other piece of electronics that'll be used is obviously the IMU, which tells us the orientation of the rocket. The IMU we're going to use is the BNO055. I built this simple breadboarded circuit that logs the data from the IMU to see what kind of data we should expect on a TVC flight. I then built this rocket to test those electronics. The electronics are housed inside this giant nose cone assembly. This black cylindrical part is where the IMU is. The actual nose cone part is screwed into the IMU housing. Below that, there's the altimeter box, which also has an eye bolt attached to it. The Jolly Logic altimeter is tied to this eye bolt. I'm also flying the Estes altimeter, just in case it works. The first launch attempt didn't go so well. So ultimately, this came down to three stupid things I did. Stupid thing number one. The morning of the launch, I realized I'd forgotten to put a launch log on the rocket, so I quickly 3D printed one. Stupid thing number two. I thought I didn't have enough time to glue the launch log on, so I just taped it. Stupid thing number three. After doing all the setup, which took a long time, we finally put it on the pad. I saw the rocket wobbling a lot because of the wind, but I thought it'd be fine. I could have easily just gone up there and put some more tape on. But I didn't. The IMU housing ended up breaking because it was so thin. The reason I made it this thin was because I wanted to match the inner and outer diameters of the body tube. But when you 3D print something like that, it's not very strong. So the next time, I prepared a lot better. I glued on a launch lug and I 3D printed another payload bay of the same design, but this time I wrapped tape around it. It's still pretty flexible, but it won't crack as easily. So a month later, we launched again. Parachute ejection never works for me for some reason. Every time we launched the Zephyr Jr. rocket, it didn't work. With the PVC rocket, it didn't work. And now this didn't work. And it's not even the same reason for not working. Because of this, we had a hard landing on the street. Ooh, might have landed on the sidewalk. Okay, let's see. Dry the logic. Oh, this said 429. Okay, 429. Uh, we'll just have to check what the other altimeter says. Oh, yeah, the blue light's still on, so it's still logging. So, turn it off. Ooh, looks like some wiring got disconnected. That's fine, all we needed some data, not some, not necessarily data the whole flight. So, I guess it got all the way down to impact. You can see those header pins are kind of messed up. It's okay. Um, this kind of came loose a little bit, but that's also fine. Okay. Okay, so now we got some data. Data or data? As you can see from the video, the Jolly Logic immediately gave us a max altitude of 429 feet. The Estes one said zero. But now it was time to go back and look at our data. The first thing I looked at was the IMU data, which logged gyro, accelerometer, and magnetometer data. There isn't really much to see here because I haven't graphed it yet, but it seems like we'll have to rely on the gyroscope data because the accelerometer's data gets distorted by gravity. 
But now, the moment we've all been waiting for, is our altimeter accurate? On the graph here, it seems like the estimated altitude before launch was negative 10 feet, and the estimated max altitude was 422 feet. Add them together and we get 432 feet. That's only a 3 foot difference from the Jolly Logics reading. This is a good sign, but it's still only one test. I repaired the rocket and removed the IMU section, so it should be doing another one of these test flights soon. Now, I think the next step for the altimeter will be to get rid of the non-zero values before launch. Every time I turn on the altimeter, the starting reference altitude is different. Sometimes it's negative 400, sometimes 100 or negative 10, and these are even at the same places, which means the same altitude above sea level. It just seems to be random. But it should be a pretty simple fix. I think when we graph it, we'll just have to find the median altitude of random points before the launch, then subtract that value from every point. By doing this, all the values before launch should be pretty close to zero. This isn't a super big deal, but it'd just be nice to clean it up. Another thing I want to do with the altimeter is to have it graph velocity and acceleration. Lastly, I want to make a PCB for it to simplify all the wiring and allow all you guys to build one. A lot of you have asked for a tutorial on how to build one, but I didn't want to make a tutorial with all the complex wiring and placements on a perf board, so a PCB will be a lot simpler. For the IMU, I'll need to figure out how much the servos need to move based on its readings when mounted on the motor mount. This will let us see how much the mount rotates when the servo actuates a certain amount. Then I'll probably make a PCB for it as well. The avionics bay will most likely be just above the TVC mount, but that does put it pretty far away from the solenoid at the top. What I might do is basically separate the avionics bay. Put one Arduino with the IMU connections to the servos at the bottom, and the altimeter connecting to the solenoid at the top. I'm hoping to start coding soon with static tests and maybe a few launches in the summer, so make sure to subscribe to not miss those tests. See you soon.